Good morning again. Welcome to Bloomer Academy and thank you for joining us today. My name is Diana Otero and I am the product engineer or product engagement manager at Bloomerang. I've been with Bloomerang for a little over five years and today we're going to be talking about how to clean up your data to improve your fundraising. Our agenda for today is first we'll take a look at what is the importance of having clean data. I know a lot of us already have an idea of why we want to keep our data clean, but we'll dig a little deeper into that and look at the benefits of having clean data. We'll also take a look at our data policies and procedures. Um, I have some questions that you can ask within your organization to help you come up with these data policies and procedures. We also have a template that you can download that will help you or help guide you um, come up with policies and procedures for your organization. We'll also take a look at and we'll walk you through the different built-in tools in Bloomerang that you can use to help identify and reduce bad data in your database. We'll be taking a look at how to manage duplicate constituents and how to merge them. We'll also take a look at our national change of address or NCOA processing, as well as our deceased suppression. Uh, we'll take a look at bad emails. Uh, we do have a bad email flag in Bloomerang, so we'll see how that works. And we'll take a look at the payment failures as well. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's not just constituent information that you need to keep clean, but transactions as well. We'll also take a look at how you can declutter your database further. We'll take a look at some questions or considerations to take into account if you're considering deactivating or deleting a constituent and some reports that can help you make these decisions. We'll also show you at the end some additional services if you need more help with your data cleanup and data maintenance. We have some additional services that might help you. Um, these are optional. We'll go through a lot of the built-in to tools in Bloomerang that we have that are free, but if you need a little bit of extra help, we have additional services to help you. And at the end, I'll recap some of the resources that um, you can use, and everybody will get a copy of the slides with links to these resources as well. So first of all, clean data helps you. Um, there's several ways that it can help you. Clear, concise data, um, can help you develop and strengthen your customer segmentation. Your data is only as good as the data or your reporting or your segmentation is only as good as the data that you have in the database or the data accuracy that you have in your database. So that's important for keeping your segmentation really tight. It also ensures that you have a single customer view. Whatever, whoever is looking at a constituent and whichever constituent you're looking at, if your data is entered consistently and accurately, you'll have the same picture for each different constituent that you're looking at, no matter who is looking at those constituents. It also helps you avoid compliance issues. You'll notice, or you may have noticed in Bloomerang, we have fields that track um, communication preference or communication restrictions, unsubscribes, um, constituents who have opted out. All of those things help you remain compliant with, let's say, the Can Spam Act or the GDPR if you're in the EU when you're communicating with your customers. A lot of these things, for example, if a constituent is marked as do not mail or do not solicit, these are things you can filter for. Or if they've opted out or unsubscribed from communications, these are things that can happen automatically, where of course we're not gonna send to those constituents if they've already told you that they don't want to be communicated. It also helps you target customers and prospects in a more effective way. This ties in a little bit more with your list segmentation. If you have accurate information about your customers or your constituents in your database, you're able to really tailor your communications to your constituents based on what segment they fall into. And lastly, it helps reduce any wasted budget spend and increase your overall ROI. Um, if you have clean data, you don't have to send letters, for example, to constituents who don't have um, mailing addresses or who might have mail 
um, incomplete mailing addresses or may have already moved. You don't have to spend your time and resources and effort um, on those things. If these things are happen automatically in the back end or you're in maintenance mode for keeping these things clean. All of these, of course, help increase your overall ROI and increase the revenue coming in if you know that your communications are reaching your desired constituents. So in terms of data policies and procedures, this is very important. Number one, to keep your data complete and accurate. It also, you want to make sure that the data is entered consistently. Perhaps you're in a small shop where um, there's only one or two people, um, but you experience turnover. You want to make sure that these policies and procedures are documented so that the, um, the next person who might be taking on the job knows exactly how to do this in the database. Or maybe you have some volunteers that to help with data entry, you want to make sure that everyone is entering things consistently. Clear, concise data entry policies and procedures are critical to keeping your database usable. And this applies to all information in your database, constituent or profile data, transactions, interactions, or touch points, additional custom fields, all of those things. It's not just one thing that you have to keep clean. You also want to standardize contact data at the point of entry. So in, in simpler terms, you can't maintain healthy data, healthy data hygiene while also letting unhealthy data into your CRM. Before cleaning data even needs to happen, you need to check important data at the point of entry. And this ensures that all information is standardized when it, when it enters your database and will make it easier to keep it clean and reduce the cleanup efforts down the road. So that's something to keep in mind. You don't always want to be in cleanup mode. You want to make sure that it's clean at the point of entry. Also, this helps you reduce duplicates and you want to think about how the data is going to affect your decision making around acknowledgements and donor communications and reporting as well. You can't run a donor report by, let's say, constituent type if the information is inconsistent or you can't filter a report by city if the information is incomplete or if it's entered one way by one person, let's say the full name, and an abbreviation or an acronym by somebody else. So you want to make sure that you're able to report on the data that you have in the database. I like to say that reporting is the way that you make sense of the data that's in your database. You're putting a lot of information in there. You want to make sure that the information is clean to enable you to make sense of that data and use it for your fundraising efforts. I'm going to show you a sample here of um, some questions to ask yourself and the people in your organization when you're developing this template. But before that, I want to find out, does your organization currently have documented data policies and procedures? I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. So please let us know if, yes, you do have a well-documented process that everyone uses, or you have one, but it is not well documented. We see this sometimes where in small shops where it's one or two people where they think because it's only one or two of them doing the data entry, um, it's not as important or it's a lower priority to get the processes documented. But it's something that, that I've learned for myself as well, that it's nice to have things documented. So if you have people helping you out, um, every, everything is entered consistently or if you're in the process of documenting it, or you don't currently have a process, um, let us know as well. I'll leave that pull up for a couple more seconds. And I wanted to take a look at what are some questions that you can ask yourself when you're thinking about clean data in your database. So you can think about are there codes or attributes that are way more expansive that they need to be? Um, are you collecting information just for the sake of collecting information? You want to make sure that you're collecting that information for a purpose. How is this information? How does collecting this information 
help you with your fundraising. For example, I would love to know everyone's favorite color, but does that really help me with my fundraising efforts or cultivation efforts? That's something you can talk about within your organization and decide for yourselves. Um, are there fields that are required that shouldn't be or not required that should be? Are people plugging in junk into those fields as a result of having to put something in there um, just to get through that compliance of being able to enter information? Does your campaign fund and appeal structure work for your organization? These are some of the things that on the basic level, I think everyone should be asking within their organization. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Thank you for all of your responses. It looks like a majority um, have one that isn't as well documented or are in the process of documenting it, followed closely by those who don't have a process. This is great, thank you for being here. We hope that you'll pick up some tips and tricks from the class. Um, we have a sample data policies and procedures template here that goes over some things about how to enter your profile, database consistency standards. Um, it also talks about transaction management, interaction management, reports, and some things that are directly related blue to Bloomerang and how you can use Bloomerang with this. So if we take a sneak peek at the Um, data policies and procedures manual here. Really what we'd like for you to take a look at here is to use this as a starting point to initiate the discussion within your team and document the results of that discussion. There is no one right answer to all of the questions because it's going to be different based on the type of your organization and the different fields that you track, but use this as a starting point for that conversation and more importantly, document those decisions that have been made. For example, when you're entering profile, um, especially for Bloomerang, we always recommend that you search constituents first. This is kind of your first step in avoiding duplicates. So before you even enter anything, search for the constituent and see if they're still there. Um, you might take a look at addresses, for example. We have a service through Bloomerang where addresses are standardized. We'll take a look at that. But if you don't have that service, um, you want to take a look at entering things um, consistently. And this doesn't just apply to addresses. If you're an alumni organization and you track um, where they graduated from or other schools that they went to? Are you entering the full school name? Are you entering abbreviations or acronyms? You want to document decisions like that. And when you document those decisions, it's always it's also important to note why you are entering things a certain way. Sometimes we look back at data and we wonder why things were entered in a specific way. For sure, there was a reason that the people at the time decided to enter it a specific way, and it's good to document why that is. And from my experience as well, when people understand why things are being done in a certain way, it's easier to get their buy-in to follow the, po the process and the policy. Um, if we scroll down further here, for example, it asks questions about um, how are you going to enter um, name fields as well. And we even show you these are name fields that populate automatically in Bloomerang. So if you have this information, this is how it populates automatically. But if you want to customize it a little bit further, you can still follow the same format. So it's consistent across all of your um, constituents. So again, these are questions that you can ask yourself. Um, database cleanup and data entry doesn't just apply to constituent information, so we have recommendations on transactions as well. So please use that as a starting point for your organization. All right, um, the next thing we're gonna take a look at is how you can identify and reduce bad data within your database. Um, the template that I showed you as well, uh, by the way, we are going to be sending the slides along with the recording and it has links to everything that we're going to show you today. So everyone will get a copy of that. So we're gonna jump into the database here. We're gonna take a look at how these 
built-in tools in Bloomerang help you with your database cleanup and keeping your database clean. We're going to take a look at duplicate constituents, NCOA processing to, to see suppression, bad emails, and payment failures. These are built-in tools in Bloomerang that are free for our standard customers. So you don't need to pay anything extra for these. Some of these do um, require for you to activate it so that it works and some work automatically. So let's take a look at that. So let's hop into my database here. The first thing that we're going to take a look at is duplicate constituents. This is a big problem um, that we've seen, so we want to help with this. There's two ways that you can see duplicate constituents. First, you'll see that this bell icon on the top that has a section that alerts you how many possible duplicate constituents you have. You can also get to that same page if you click on this link that says duplicate constituents. Duplicate constituents or potential duplicates are presented to you in pairs. We want you to resolve them in pairs. You can't mass merge duplicates because as you make those merges, based on our algorithm, um, it could affect how other potential duplicates are matched or not matched as well. One of the things I wanted to talk about here is how Bloomerang determines potential duplicates in your system. So first, you're never going to see um, a duplicate match where the only thing that matches between two individuals is a name. If they have the same name, but the details are completely different. So for example, if you have two John Smiths in your database with different email addresses, different phone numbers, different addresses, they're probably different people, and John Smith is a pretty common name. Um, that's not a match that you'll see in Bloomerang. Um, for a name match, there needs to be an additional piece of information in order for Bloomerang to determine that this is a potential duplicate. So their name plus a, a contact information needs to match. So you'll see here, for example, we have Cody Lawson that has been matched because his name and phone number match, his name and another piece of information match. If you see an instance like this where you're confident that this is a duplicate, you can go in and see more details so you can determine how to merge those constituents. So you'll see a side-by-side -side comparison of the two accounts for Cody here and the differences. Now, when you decide to keep an individual account, let's say we'll keep this first account, you'll notice that there's going to be some changes. Anything in red here means that that's going to be taken out when the accounts are merged. And you'll notice here that initially this had 12 interactions, but now it's up to 15 because this information is being added to this account. If we scroll down as well, any name fields or, or how it's been changed is going to be changed. Um, for address, email address, and phone information, nothing is ever really lost. Everything is added into the primary account. One thing to take a look at here is whichever account you decide to keep, the contact information of that keep account becomes the primary information. So it will keep the primary information that was on the account you're going to keep, and it will add everything else to the account. So you're not losing any of that contact information. Everything is going to be merged. You're not losing any of the timeline information as well. Everything is going to be merged. Once you decide which account to keep and you select merge, you can click yes. It's going to merge those accounts and it will no longer appear in your duplicate constituents. You might also see some in instances where they are not duplicates. For example, here we have Jean-Luc Picard and Starfleet. They're being matched because Jean-Luc Picard is my contact person for this organization, Starfleet, and they have the same phone number. Um, in this case, 
I do want to keep these as separate accounts because Jean-Luc Picard as an individual supports my organization and Starfleet as a separate entity as its own organization supports my or supports my organization as well. So if you see cases like this where it's not a duplicate or in the example that we have had earlier or of someone like John Smith, which is a very common name and it's not a duplicate, you can always check not a duplicate. So this is a good way to check. Um, I'm going to pause for now and come back to this. So this is something that you can do a couple of every day. Now we alert you as soon as we identify any potential duplicates. But if you happen to encounter a larger number, don't feel pressured to merge or resolve everything you can do five a day, you can do a couple a day, um, and that just helps with your daily maintenance for your duplicates. Another thing I do want to mention that we've gotten questions before is, what if um, you know of duplicates or of potential duplicates, but they're not identified under duplicate constituents. This could happen, let's say, if they're matching on name only, but let's say one account doesn't have contact information. So there isn't enough to be able to, for the system to determine if they're a match. You can always go to that constituent account and there is an option within the constituents profile to merge from here as well. So if you click on the drop down arrow, there's an option to merge here. So if you have constituents or potential uh, or or potential duplicate constituents that don't appear in your duplicate constituents list, you can always go to their specific account and initiate the merge from there. And that's how our duplicate constituents work. Um, this is great because, um, like I mentioned, you want to make sure that all the timeline information is on the same account. Maybe um, I was entered manually and then I made an online donation using my um, personal email rather than the, than the work email that the database has and the system wasn't able to match, match me. Um, you don't necessarily want to see that new donation as coming from a new constituent. So you want to make sure you're getting that full picture for that constituent and not having information on the same constituent in different accounts. So um, duplicate constituents. The next thing that I want to show you is our NCOA processing. NCOA is the national change of address. So if any of you have ever moved and you've filed an NCOA, a national change of address with the post office to forward your mail to the new address, that's what we mean. And that's the information that we're pulling from. This is a service that is free with standard with your standard license. So if you're a free, if you have a free Bloomerang database or if you're grow, you may not have it, but this comes free with standard. But this is something you need to activate in order for it to start working. So I'm going to show you how to activate that and we'll look at some samples of how it updates the data or updates the addresses in your database. If you're an administrator in the database, you can go to settings and then view all settings and go to my organization. Scroll all the way down and you should have this option for NCOA. Now, my button here says view NCOA dashboard because I've already turned this on. If you haven't turned this on yet, if you haven't activated yet, it's going to say activate NCOA processing. Now, how does it work and how does it update the data in your database? Let's take a look at a couple of examples here. If we take a look at this constituent, um, so far it looks like the same constituent profile that you would see it anywhere else in Bloomerang. But if you take a look at the addresses, you're going to see here there's going to be an address note. The only time 
that an address is going to have a note if there was is if there was an NCOA associated with your database and the address was updated as a result of the NCOA. A couple of things that you're going to see here. First, it's going to tell you the NCOA update, the date of the NCOA update. This is the date that the update was, was made to your database. It's also going to show the move date because in this instance, this address was updated because a move was found for this constituent. So the move date is likely going to be different from your update date because this is the date that we found with the post office that the move date was filed or the NCOA was filed. This is when my database was updated. So it's always going to show the reason. We'll take a look at some different reasons that you, will, you might see from an NCOA update as well. And it's even going to show you what the old address is. So if a move is found, the new address is going to be added to the constituent. The new address is going to be made primary, and it's going to add this NCOA note. Notice that it never removes the old address. The NCOA update does not delete any information that's in your, in your database, but it will tell you um, if this is the old address. And if you look at the old address as well, it's also going to have a note there for the new address. That way, in case anyone accidentally switches the primary address from new to old, you can always verify and check which the NCOA says is um, new or old. Now, this happens as often as nightly. Once you turn it on, it's going to scan all of the information in your database. Um, you will get an email notification if any updates are found and made on your database, and you can report on this information as well. We'll show you that in a little bit. But it can happen as often as nightly, and I say as often as because it depends on how often you're entering data into the database, and it also it depends when that constituent um, files for a move when we get that information. So every night your database is checked, it is, and then it is compared against the USPS database. And if there's a change, it gets updated. If there's not, um, nothing gets updated. And you'll get notifications for that. Another thing that you might see um, is, or another update that you might see from the NCOA is if, if addresses are standardized. So we'll take a look at this constituent. And if we take a look at their address, it's going to also have a note, an NCOA note, telling me the NCOA update. And this time, it's saying that the reason is standardized. Addresses are going to be standardized based on USPS standards. So you'll notice, for example, things like, is, you, is it spelling out road or street or avenue? Based on USPS standards, they just use the abbreviation. So everything's going to be standardized to RD or AVE or ST. It will also take a look at adding the zip plus four. So instead of just having the five digit zip code, it's going to add um, the plus four to the zip code. Another change that you might see from here is if there's a suite number or apartment number, the US Postal Service has its own way of, is that gonna be on a separate line? Is that on one line? Does the street address come first versus the apartment number? Those are the things that it standardizes. And the reason that you'll see here is standardized. A third thing that you might see in terms of address updates are if the address is non-mailable, what happens then? So a couple of things that you'll notice with this constituent first is that their address is has been automatically marked as bad. This is something that you can do as well manually if you, if you already know that the address is bad. However, if you have the NCOA processing turned on. Um, it's and for some reason, the US Postal Service has this on record as a non mailable address. It's going to have that NCOA note, it's going to have the reason of non mailable, and it's going to mark the address as bad. 
So it's going to appear on the checkbox here and it's going to appear on the constituent header. Again, the service never deletes any information in your database, but it's going to be marked as a bad address. Um, not surprising for Ron Swanson since he's, since he's a fictional character with a fictional um, address. So those are the three things address-wise that you would find um, might be updated with your database as a result if your um, if you turn on the NCOA processing. You can report on all of this information as well. I have a pre-made report here that I like to take a look at. Um, I like having this report in the database, especially after I get that email notification that a, an update was made to my database. I can always take a look at um, the NCOA changes. So in this case, I'm using a constituent report and I'm filtering on specific addresses. There's different ways you can take a look at this. For example, here I'm just, um, I'm just filtering for anywhere or any note that contains NCOA because again, um, the only time the address is going to have a note is if there's an NCOA that happens. I also like adding a column for the note itself. The note itself is going to tell me um, what the NCOA update is. I like looking at the reason here, like this is standardized, this is non-mailable, or there was a move found. And if I want it to be more specific, I can do that as well. Any of those three reasons that I showed earlier, you can report on that. So for example, I can just report on note contains move, and that will isolate just the NCOA updates because um, a move was found. Or I can just take a look at non-mailable, for example. This is something that I really like because if we don't have a mailable address for this constituent, um, we're limited in how we can reach this constituent. So at this point, for example, I might ask um, our organization or Bloomerang, you know, is there any way to find addresses for these constituents that are good? Because the way that the NCOA update works is it looks at the existing address in the database and tries to see if it can find a move or if it can update it. But in the case of it's non-mailable, but no new mailable address was found, nothing's going to be updated. But maybe, you know, if we have a large number of constituents who don't have an address or who have non-mailable address, is it time to consider an address append? Or um, if we have a volunteer or board members, are these, um, do those volunteers or board members have contact information for these? Or do we have phone numbers for these constituents where we can ask them for these, this information? Do we have their email address and we can ask them to complete their information? So I like having these reports in my database. I'm going to cancel out of that for now. Well, actually, before I cancel, just to recap, I'm using a constituent report here, filtering for has any specific address, looking at the note, and you can always change up the note based on what you want to take a look at. You can say note contains NCOA. Um, that will be everything. You can say note contains non-mailable, note contains move, or note contains standardized. And again, to turn that on, you go to your settings, view all settings, my organization, scroll down to that NCOA um, section. And if you're not sure if you have if you have it turned on, maybe you haven't had an update in a while. Um, you can um, take a look here. If it says activate NCOA dashboard, it hasn't been turned on yet. And once you turn it on, that's pretty much all you need to do. Those updates are gonna start happening automatically. Um, there are a couple of more things you can do if you view the NCOA dashboard. We're not gonna go into that now, but we'll include a link to the documentation for example, if you want to pause um, the NCOA processing or if there are certain constituents that you don't want to be updated, let's say it's a major donor and you want to review their information before any updates are made, um, you, can, 
you can turn off the syncing for the for those specific constituents but once you turn it on everything starts happening automatically and this is free if you have a standard bloomerang database and that is our ncoa processing another thing before we move on from that another thing uh, or another benefit that you get from activating the NCOA processing is the deceased suppression. So, so far we've only looked at how the NCOA processing affects the addresses in your database, but it also comes with deceased processing. So let's take a look at a constituent in my database. You'll notice that this constituent on their header, they have been marked as deceased. This is because the NCOA processing was able to find a first name plus last name plus address match um, with a deceased record um, for that name and address. Um, it's only going to mark the constituent as deceased if it exactly matches the first name, last name, plus mailing address. Typically what they find for this is the obituary. And if you do go into the NCOA dashboard, that's another thing you can take a look at is they'll most likely have a link to the obituary so that you can verify another time. It never hurts to check again that this is in fact the same constituent at that address that's, that's been marked as deceased. Um, and you can report on that information as well. I have another report in my database here that I take a look at. Um, any constituent status changes from the NCOA because I changed this. Um, because you can take a look at the status because it is their status that's being updated this time instead of their address. Status is deceased and um, they were updated or last modified as a result of an NCOA. You can take a look at that. And that's the deceased suppression. So both of those come automatically when you turn on or when you activate the NCOA processing in your database. The next thing I want to take a look at in terms of keeping your constituent data clean is the bad emails. Now, unlike the NCOA processing, um, bad emails, this happens automatically. This is not something you need to turn on. So let's take a look at Sherlock Holmes. That's a different Sherlock Holmes. Here we go. So you'll notice here that Sherlock um, has been marked as someone with a bad email address. The bad email address flag is something that happens automatically and is not something that you can mark manually. If you find a bad email address for a constituent that you know is bad or has not been delivered, you can always go ahead and delete that email address if you'd like. But because we don't, we, we are careful with your data, we don't just want to be deleting stuff in there. If our service finds a bad email address in your database, we alert you to this so that you can take appropriate action. So let's take a look at that. So we have the bad email address flag here. And if we go to Sherlock's profile and take a look at the email address, you, you'll see that it tells you this address has been marked as bad due to an email deliverability issue. The reason we want to, to alert you of these bad email addresses is that this will affect your email sending, or this could affect your email sending reputation. And the higher your reputation is, the higher the chances of your emails getting to your constituents inbox instead of being marked as spam. So we want to protect your email sending reputation and make sure that you have high deliverability. It also tells you the bad email reason. In this case, it says that the domain can't receive email because I've mistyped it here or maybe because um, that's a fake 
um, email client that I'm that I'm using. As soon as you enter an email address and save it, if that is the primary email address, you'll get feedback on that right away and it can automatically get marked as bad. So you'll see I have, I have other email addresses as bad because I've been testing it with um, fake email addresses. Um, and as soon as you make a change the primary email address, that primary email address is getting, um, or that primary email address is getting scanned as a bad email address. And you can report on all of this information as well. Let's take a look at that. So if we run a report, I'm gonna run a constituent report, go to, Oops, click on that first. Has email addresses, specific email addresses where it's been marked as bad. And you can even take a look at primary um, because that's what's being scanned and that's what we, we um, mail to. So these, it looks like from my database, I have nine constituents found. Um, where their primary email address is marked as bad. I want to take a look at this right away because um, any when you're sending emails out of Bloomerang, any email addresses that have been marked as bad, we're automatically taking that out. We're automatically excluding that because we already know that it's undeliverable. And if you try to mail to that address and it's undeliverable, again, that affects your email sending reputation. So we automatically take that out. So it's good to take a look at and see, okay, I have nine um, bad email addresses in my database. What do I do from here? First, if all of these are indeed bad, try to see, do we have a second piece of um, email do we have a secondary email address for them? Maybe if we switch to that instead, then they're gonna get our emails. Or maybe we can contact the constituent um, and ask for updated information if we personally know that constituent or have that relationship with them. Another thing to take a look at is, you know, if again, if I have a large number of bad email addresses or no email addresses, is it time to consider an email append? Um, now, if I take a look at the this report and I see, for example, oh, hey, Dean Winchester. Um, yep, I know that that's I know that that's his correct email address. Um, I know Dean personally, and that's his correct email address. This can be marked as valid. So what you need to do there is you can contact our support team and show them um, that the email is valid. That could be in the form of you, ha you have received um, communications from this constituent at this email address. Obviously, if they're emailing you from the, this email address, that email address is valid. Um, another thing is to take a look at is, um, have you sent them emails from Bloomerang prior to it being marked as bad? And does the email from Bloomerang, when you look at the tracking, show that they've opened it? Um, if they're opening those emails and we can see that they're opening those emails, obviously the, the email address isn't bad. So if you do find anything that's been mistagged, um, make a note of those, take a look at um, if they've emailed you from that address or if you, they have email opens from that address and get in touch with our support team to make sure that gets marked as valid. This is a service that's provided for free and we do it um, through a company, an entity called um, Tower Data. And sometimes it does happen wh where they're a little bit aggressive with, with marking it as bad to make sure, again, to protect your email sending reputation. So if that happens, not to worry, our support team can, can help with that. And that's your um, bad email addresses. Now, the bad email addresses, of course, um, you'll notice that if you have any emails that were unsubscribed um, or have dropped or bounced, you can see those in the email tracking as well. Um, but I like this because it automatically tells you 
and this is a report you can run over and over. So I'm just going to save this and save bad emails. So this is something that I can keep in my database. So let's say I have it as part of my process too. Let's say weekly, go through and see if I have any bad emails. Um, or if you're a little bit forgetful like me sometimes, you can even schedule the report to get sent to your email address. So let's say on a weekly basis, you can review, um, in this case, for example, I have nine. What do we do with that nine? Do we just remove that, that, that email address? Do we find a new email address? Is there anything that needs to be marked as valid so that it comes directly to my inbox and I can review it from there? And that's our bad emails. That's our bad email flag. So again, different from our NCOA processing, the bad email flag, that happens automatically. You don't need to go anywhere to turn that on. The NCOA and deceased processing, that is something you need to turn on. The next thing that I want to take a look at is our payment failures dashboard. This comes in handy for those of you who have pledge payments or recurring gift payments that are set up for auto processing. And while we're on that topic, um, if you would let me know, I'm, I'm going to launch a poll here. If you do have any pledges or recurring gift payments that are set up for auto processing. While the responses are coming in, I'm going to reset here. Um, and talk a little bit about if you have a transaction processor connected with your Bloomerang database, um, one of the benefits of that, or well, two big benefits that you get from that is that you can process donations from within your Bloomerang database, and you can set pledge payments and recurring donation payments to process automatically based on schedule. And of course, it also allows you to create online giving forms. Today, we're going to be focusing on the auto processing piece. So let's go back to Sherlock a little bit here. Let's say we were entering a new pledge or a new recurring donation for Sherlock. I'm not going to fill out all of these details, but if you select um, an auto payment method of credit card and Sherlock gives us his credit card number. Um, let's say he has a pledge that he wants to pay on monthly. If we have his card details, we can input that here. And instead of having to ha him having to send a check every month, for example, if we have those credit card details, that's just automatically going to process every month according to whichever schedule he set. It looks like most of you have um, auto, processing, uh, auto processing set up. So let's take a look at, let's say we save this and we har have the card on file, but we wanna make sure they actually process. If for whatever reason a card fails to process, we have an alert here that tells you how many credit card payment failures you have. And if we go in it, um, this takes us to our credit card payment failures dashboard. And I do want to clarify that this is specifically for credit cards. Um, we don't get the feedback from EFT transactions fast enough or accurately enough to be able to get, do this for EFT. So this is for credit cards. It tells you your fiscal year revenue at risk and any fiscal year revenue recaptured. It takes a look at your fiscal year revenue at risk. Let's say you have a recurring donation here from Albus Dumbledore for let's say $5 a month. It calculates if how many months you still have left in your fiscal year times the amount that they're paying monthly, that's how much you would potentially lose if you don't resolve this particular payment failure. And it calculates that for everything. So, so if I don't fix this, I'm potentially losing out on over $1,000 of recurring revenue. So I want to make sure to fix that. So a couple of things you'll see here. First, you'll see a processor response. This comes directly from your transaction processor. So it can be as detailed or as specific as your card's expiration year is invalid or the expiration month is invalid or AVS decline, address verification decline. Or it can be as vague as 
card declined. This comes directly from the processor. I like taking a look at the reason here and a combination of um, the status, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to determine what kind of action I need to take for this particular or to resolve this particular failure. So obviously, if the card is expired, um, I'm going to need to call the donor, right? But let's say the processor response here is card declined. I want to take a look at the status as well. You'll see here that this one, for example, says next scheduled payment. This one says no next scheduled payment. This one says retrying automatically on a certain date. Whenever a credit card payment failure or when occurs in Bloomerang, Bloomerang is going to retry the same card every other day for the next seven days. So it's going to retry three times in the next seven days. So this means that this particular um, payment is still within that retrying period. So if I see a message that says card declined, maybe in the system, maybe it was insufficient funds, maybe it was just a matter of bad timing, but Bloomerang is going to retry. And let's say I see that it retries in two days, I might wait for those two days to see if it'll go through when it retries again. But if it already tells me that it's invalid, no matter how many times Bloomerang retries, you know it's still going to fail. So I'm going to go ahead and call that donor right away. Now, what happens if it's beyond that seven-day retrying period? If it's beyond that seven days, it's going to try again the next time the scheduled payment is. So if it's a monthly payment, it's going to try again next month. If there is no more installments in the future, it's going to see no scheduled payment. I'm going to want to call the donor right away because there is no other date that it's going to try again. So that's a signal to me. I need to call this donor right away. Now, if I wanted to resolve, of course, I want to resolve these payment failures. I would go to the constituents account, click resolve. That takes me directly to the pledge or the schedule. And I'm going to want to put in a new card. Whether you're updating a card with a new expiration date or um, you're entering an entirely new card, you still need the full card details. So I'm going to enter that and it's going to give me two options when I'm saving. I can go to the timeline or reprocess the failed payment. If I go to the timeline, it's not going to charge the card today. It's going to save that new card the next time it tries to charge the payment. But I can also reprocess the failed payment to reprocess the, the last or the latest failed payment. So it's important to get to this as soon as possible because we're not suddenly going to charge the card for all of the missed payments if they had more than one. We're only going to charge the most recent missed payment. So you want to get to this as soon as possible. It's also an easier conversation with the donor if there's only been one missed payment as opposed to, oh, now there's been 10 missed payments before you're calling them. So it's important to keep that relationship. And while you're already on the phone with them, you know, you might um, initiate the conversation depending on your relationship with the donor of maybe they would like to upgrade. Maybe there's other ways they'd like to be involved with your organization. Or conversely, maybe you look at your credit card payment failures as we look at it here because we resolve that. Our fiscal year revenue at risk goes down, our revenue recaptured goes up. But let's say I call Albus Dumbledore and he tells me, you know what, um, it's a bit tight right now, so I can't continue. You can end the schedule. Either way, it's nice to know. And it's, it's still a good touch point with that donor. Maybe there's other ways that he can be involved with your organization right now if he's not able to continue his his. Re is recurring donation. And again, we alert you as soon as a failure happens. So I like getting on this as soon as possible. Um, and th to me, that's part of our database cleanup because what is, I mean, if, if none of these are gonna be processing, um, I don't wanna be counting on the cash flow 
um, or projected revenue for this if, if it's not going to come in. So to me, that's a huge part of the database cleanup. And those are the built-in tools that you have in Bloomerang to help with your database cleanup. So going back here um, to our presentation, um, all of this, these are built in to your Bloomerang database. Um, all of these are free. The national change of addresses, address and disease suppression, this is something you have to turn on, um, but everything else happens automatically in your database. Now, what else can you do? Um, you have clean data or you've started with your clean data. Um, you want to declutter your database too. Think about, is there any missing data that we can fill in? Because again, if I don't have an address, phone number, or email address for a constituent, how do I cultivate that relationship with them? Is there anything that we can fill in based on one piece of information that we have? or one piece of contact information that we have and we can get the rest? Or do we split it up between our board members or volunteers to find that information? Or do we, we avail of additional services that might help fill in the missing data? That's up to your organization. You'll need to take a look at the bandwidth that you have for that and the resources that you're willing to um, devote to that. When you're cleaning up your database as well, um, I recommend running reports on when was the last time constituents opened an email? Uh, what do I do with email unsubscribes? If I have constituents in my database that haven't opened an email from me in the last year, what's going on? Um, do I want to keep them in my database if they're not opening my emails? Are they being engaged in a different way? You know, maybe they're not opening my emails, but their overall engagement is still high because they attend in-person events, or they volunteer, or they donate. Um, donations or giving history is a good thing to take a look at as well. We get this question a lot from our customers of, what's the cutoff? Like if someone, if the last time someone gave was a year, two, three, four, five years ago, is that the time to remove them from your database? And there isn't really a right or wrong, or there isn't really one right answer to that. But I want you to think about how much appetite do you have for re-engagement efforts? If you have this report and you see 100 constituents, for example, um, or 100 donors that have given before but haven't donated in a year, are you going to devote some time and some energy to re-engage these donors? Um, is it gonna be the same if they haven't given in two years? So think about it in terms of that. How much appetite do you have for your re-engagement efforts? We also have a free ebook here that you can download that tells you, that gives you an idea of a good schedule for your regular maintenance. I mentioned earlier, try to do it in smaller chunks so it doesn't feel daunting that you have all of these things to clean up. And again, you can download this for free um, and it gives you suggestions for, you know, maybe on a weekly, daily basis, do this. On a monthly basis, do this. Um, every 12 months, run an NCOA or just turn it on and it can happen as much as nightly. And Again, you use this as a starting point. Maybe there are things you want to do more frequently. Do it on a quarterly basis instead of every 12 months. Do it every month instead of quarterly. Find a system that works for your organization. Um, and again, I find that giving yourself like smaller things to do um, helps keep it cleaner big picture so you don't have such an overwhelming task to clean up later on. We also have some additional services that you can take a look at if you need additional help. Um, this is optional. Um, I'm going to show the website here for our additional services and while I'm doing that I'm actually going to go ahead and launch a poll for if you want more information on this, if you want a member of our team to contact you for more information on this, uh, let us know. 
So for example, we have phone append services. Let's say the way this works is, let's say you have names and email addresses and you want to find a phone number for them, you can avail of this service. Um, or if you have name and mailing address, but you want to find email address, Again, this would depend on your cultivation strategy. Do you, do you communicate more via phone, via email, via letters? You have those options for getting that additional contact information. There's also demographic and other additional data appends as well. Or if you're kind of, you've already done your cleanup and you're looking to really clean up your database, maybe take some information out of there. We do have a mass delete service. I, I like thinking of that as my nuclear option at the very end. Um, I like to um, give some time toward re-engagement efforts before I go that option. But if that's where you are, that's fine too. Um, and, and we can help with that. Um, thank you for your answers. Um, we'll make sure to you get that follow-up as well. And of course, these are some resources to what we talked about today. And everyone is going to get a copy of these slides as well. So you will get the link. Um, this is a free template that you can download. This is a free ebook that you can download. Um, and all the links will be there. It looks like we don't have any open questions at the moment, but if you have additional questions down the road, don't forget that help is only a click away. You can click on that question mark icon on the top right of your database. From there, you can access our help in videos. That's our entire knowledge base. You can also send an email to our support team from here or initiate a live chat online. Any of the reports that we showed you today, any of the services, that we showed you, you can always ask our support team about it and they'll be more than happy to help. Um, thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.